Thank you for coming to today's Capture Center Grand Rounds. We have two very key speakers today. Um, we tend to think of cancer in many different ways in terms of um, the clinical aspect of cancer or the, or the molecular aspect of cancer, but we don't often think about the evolutionary aspect of cancer. So we will be taught about that by Jose Costa. Thank you, Dan. <clears throat> I'll try to actually do more than evolution, <laughs> but not much more. So uh, thanks for the opportunity of sharing some thoughts about uh, how some of the fundamental questions about the pathobiology of tumors really inform our translational research agenda. And in order to do that, it's always good to have a standard. And I think we all would agree that uh, the knowledge provided by uh, mo molecular biology of the cancer cell has been an extremely successful way to access translational, particularly therapeutic uh, medicine, since we now have targeted therapies like immunotherapy or targeted drugs that address each one of the molecular defects present in a cancer cell and in fact underlying the phenotype, the behavioral phenotype of the cancer cell. So keeping that in mind, I think it's worthwhile looking at other areas that have been in the background of, again, informing our translational research agenda with the thought that in the future, I think, they will hopefully undergo development, they will be applied, and they will help us overcome some of the limitations that therapy has today. And I thought it would be uh, good to frame uh, these aspects uh, using the three questions that Sidney Brenner uh, teaches biologists to think about when they study organism. How does it work, physiology? How is it built, development? and how it is that it comes to be what it is, which is evolutionary natural history or evolutionary history of the organism. And so you can think of cancer not only as cell, the cancer cell, but I think nowadays we are all comfortable already moving into the next level of organization of complexity in the organization scale, which is tissue and organism. And so the, the aspect of the first question, how does it work, uh, that I would like to address briefly is the population structure of tumors. Very early on in the building of multicellular organisms, uh, there was division of labor among the different types of cells, not only among the germ cell and the somatic cell, which is obviously a major division of labor, but also in tissues among different types that compose the tissue to carry out different functions. And there is a crucial cell that's charged with the maintenance, the homeostatic maintenance of the tissue, and possibly with the repair functions of the tissue when the tissue receives info, insults, and that's the stem cell. And you are all familiar with the recent surge of literature in terms of cancer stem cells, uh, because it is felt that like normal tissues, cancer tissues have this division of labor in this population structure, and that there are in the tumors clonogenic cells that are themselves capable of regenerating the complex phenotype that is expressed in the community of tumor cells. But not only is there a stem cell in tumors, but there is likely to be, like in normal tissues, a whole hierarchical organization of cell populations with its own intrinsic dynamics. And I think we still understand this very poorly, and I would submit to you that a better knowledge of the population structure in tumors will be important in using targeted therapies in the smartest way possible. Now, stem cells in normal tissues still have very shadowy areas in terms of our knowledge. The conventional theory uh, 
said that stem cells are slow replicating cells that divide asymmetrically to generate a population that will undergo transit and differentiation and to replenish the cell that has divided. But it's now clear that even in tissues that function with a stem cell, there are probably at least two populations or subpopulations of stem cells, one that is quiescent and one that is in fact asymmetrically dividing and generating an amplified population transit and differenti differentiating population. And perhaps uh, one of the groups that has contributed the most is the group of Hans Clevers uh, studying the biology of the intestine. But it turns out that this is a very appealing uh, scheme for organization of tissues, but it turns out that not all the tissues have these types of stem cells. That in fact there are tissues, specifically epithelia, like the interfollicular areas of the skin and the esophageal epithelium, that do not have a stem cell, professional stem cell, I would say, but that they have cells in the basal layer that can stochastically uh, divide and give rise to a proliferating suprabasal population of cells that would expand. And one of the most beautiful studies is the one by Dupay et al. published recently uh, that making use of l genetic labels and fluorescent labels of chromatin protein uh, shows in a, in a very uh, definitive way, in my opinion, that one can find in tissues that maintain their homeostasis, again, expanding clones that are derived from a single stem cell in the suprabasal layer. And we'll, I'll have more to say about this clonal expansion in the tissue epithelia that you can see being followed here uh, for a period of a year results in clones expanding progressively in size in terms of the number of cells that constitutes their population. And so they follow a scale power that's linear of, ex of expansion in terms of their populations. And the same phenomenon is seen when tissues repair wounds. In fact, when the esophageal epithelium repairs a win wound introduced by endoscopy in the mouse, all the clones around it raise to fill the empty space left by a wound. And again, we'll come back to that aspect a bit later on. The other uh, peculiarity of population st cell structure in tumors is that again, rather than professional stem cells, in some tumor types, you may have stemness being a dynamic quality of the cells. So that the stem cell is not always a stem cell. It may be lost by an accident. And other cells take over the property of stemness. And again, we know very little of that. But certainly in melanoma, as you can see, it's one of the tumors where if one looks for cancer stem cells with fixed properties, one has a great deal of trouble finding them, and one finds many cells with stemness properties and the ability to replicate the tumor in a clonogenic way. In terms of clinical applications, I think it will be important to understand how the tumor cell populations are constituted and once, and once more what the dynamics among the different compartments are, because if you inhibit the transit from the first stem cell to the second expanding population, you obviously will have more effect than if you inhibit the transit of the populations way out into the differentiating end of the hierarchy. Recently, a group of MIT has looked at expression profiles in uh, databases and come up with a set of 189 genes, expression levels of 189 genes that constitute a stemness signature throughout many types of tumors. And in fact, the orthologs in the mouse of those genes also provide a signature for embryological development of stem cell lineages in the mouse. And what's interesting is that the signature tends to correlate with the phenotype in the sense that the stemness index varies 
in different organs, as you can see, or in tumors derived from different organ sites, uh, depending on the grade of the tumor. In other words, low-grade tumors by conventional pathological morphological criteria or well-differentiated tumors have an elevated index of stepness, whereas undifferentiated tumors have a less structured cell population and are probably more closer to the picture that I showed you from the work of Roche, uh, showing the dynamic nature of stem stemness in those cell populations. Which, of course, means, again, that we should be able to adapt our therapeutic strategies when they are tightly targeted to different cell populations to this type of different scenarios in the tumors. So let me now deal with uh, how the tumors are built or the developmental history of tumors. And this is a, a rather... Uh, different situation because when one looks at the development of a tumor, rather than finding a uh, change that is a transformational change that goes through different uh, steps of development, one finds very much a type of variational change that's typical of microevolutionary processes. So, in fact, developing a tumor is characterized by a microevolutionary process and as we shall see shortly, this process can also be described with uh, the laws of a field in ecology that is metapopulation dynamics that was founded by Richard Levins in 1969. So I think nowadays nobody doubts that we have plenty of data uh, indicating that the formation of a tumor and the progression of a tumor in a patient, in a living patient, the progression and the relapses can be described by a microevolutionary process. And in fact, this is uh, an example from the work of Mel Greaves, who was one of the major uh, players in generating the microevolutionary theory of tumors in leukemias. Uh, using a multiplex in situ fluorescence hybridization to characterize eight genetic lesions cell by cell, showing that indeed in leukemia you have these variegated clones that are dynamic, that do not follow a linear pathway of progression, but that they can show, they can follow multiple alternate pathways and a rather complicated uh, than life history of the tumor. And again, as we develop targeted technologies, I think understanding this type of biology and the cell lineage of each tumor cell will be extremely important. Now, if you have evolution, of course, the immediate question is, do you have selection? Because there is no evolution without the strength of selection that uses the variation present in a substrate to generate different populations uh, of, of cells, in this case of tumors. And a uh, long time ago, relatively speaking, we looked at whether progression implied selection by simply cloning short pieces of a tumor and oncogene, in this case Kirsten Ras, in colonic carcinomas and pre-cancer lesions of the human, and asking do you get increased selection of activating mutations as the lesion progresses from a normal tissue by morphology uh, to an adenoma, a benign tumor, to a carcinoma. And we did this in a limited fashion at the time. But you can see that the number of mutations uh, is indeed uh, increasing when you look at the percentage of mutations that activate the uh, oncogenic potential of Kirsten Ras, whereas one finds uh, 22 uh, mutations in normal tissues, one only finds one mutation among those 22 that activates the gene, whereas in benign lesions, this percentage goes up, and of course in carcinomas, it's even higher. And that just shows you that what we are witnessing here is the increased fitness of those cells to become dominant in the tumor. Uh, so it tells us that there is some 
advantage to the cells, it doesn't tell us indeed whether the genotype of the resulting tumor is in any way shaped by external factors like the environment or even the endogenous characteristics of the host that supports the growth of the tumor. Uh, we tried in the late 80s uh, to ask the question whether environmental factors of uh, patients uh, would influence the genotypes of the tumors they were harboring. And a good uh, tumor system is colorectal cancer, and a good population laboratory was the island of Mallorca. Of course, islands are good population laboratories because they are usually uh, stable populations and they have a very homogeneous culture. And we had very good data thanks to a, a, a tumor registry uh, on the nutrient <coughs> characteristics of that population. And what we found to our surprise was that indeed there were two uh, nutrient components of the diet that behave very differently depending on whether the tumor that had uh, arisen in the patient had a mutated phenotype in terms of kirsten ras or had a wild type phenotype in, in terms of kirsten ras people had the same number of tumors, but what these results indicate is that, for example, monounsaturated fatty acid high intake, which is essentially olive oil in the Mediterranean diet, was protective if you had a patient that developed a Kirsten Ras wild type tumor. But it was not protective if the patient had a Kirsten Ras mutated tumor. What this suggests is that very early on in the development of those tumors, the acquisition by cells of a mutated genotype can change the susceptibility to selective agents that operate in the patient. In other words, you can think of monounsaturated fatty acids or the reverse mirror image with calcium as filters that, that let cells with kirsten Ras mutated genotype go through uh, but are able to inhibit kirsten Ras wild type genotype. So if a cell that's being inhibited in terms of the proliferation acquires a mutation, will now be blind to the presence of monounsaturated fatty acids. So what this suggests is that it's going to be hard to see weak selection effects in human populations, and indeed those studies are difficult to reproduce because there are probably many factors influencing the outcomes of, of this series. But they do provide uh, an indication that throughout the natural history of the tumor, how the environment influences its development and its genotype, how it canalizes the genotype may be quite different. In the experimental animal, of course, it's easier to set up studies, and you can see here that one can select for Kirsten Ras mutated tumors in the proximal colon of rats that have been subjected to one single dose of mutagen by having a diet that's very high in polyunsaturated fatty acids. And an issue that has not been well appreciated in the natural history of tumors is the fact that oncogenic mutations can be found in normal tissues that will never develop a tumor. And when these uh, results were first reported, of course, they met with a great deal of resistance because it was not uh, in keeping with the idea that mutations were necessary to cause tumor, and therefore, if you had a mutation in an oncogene, you were destined to be a tumor. In fact, you can have a mutation in, in a cell in a tissue at the same level that you see in tissues that will develop tumors, and nothing happens to this organism. The reason is that the cells are cleansed from the tissue before the clones are capable of expanding to such size that accumulation of a second mutation becomes very likely. So think about the yellow clones in the epithelium of the esophagus. If the clone is extremely small, and the stem cell that maintains dies, the clone will go away and be replaced by a wild type clone. And in fact, in normal tissues, one can find random variation of the frequencies of mutations in a different points in time, like it's illustrated here, that the same mutation 
will appear to vary from 9.3% to 44% 10 to the minus 3 in the same colonic tissue of the animals. Reinforcing the fact that there are mutations in, in normal tissues are recent results coming from GWAS studies that show, in fact, that one can detect clonal mosaicism in normal people and that, that the frequency of clonal mosaicism goes up with age and is associated not only with increasing age but also with the presence of cancer, suggesting that there is some predisposing effect of tissue mosaicism to uh, develop a, a tumor. So what these results indicate is that when there is variation in the tissues, uh, there is information content that you can exploit. And in fact, you can think of each cell being characterized by a set of genetic alterations, even by one alteration, and plotting the frequency of those alterations in the tissue may in fact be a forecast, allow you to forecast the appearance of a tumor and the expansion of a tumor. Because as selection takes uh, on the expansion of mutated cells, you would see the frequencies of those clones, in this particular case clone D, go up. And indeed you can show that this is reproducible in patients if you happen to be looking carefully at the percentage of mutated uh, molecules, in this case five alleles of kirsten ras and uh, seven alleles of kirsten ras and 15 alleles of p53 in the pancreatic juice of patients with cancer, patients with chronic pancreatitis, or patients with no known pancreatic pathology. And what you see is that they have very different variational spectra for the frequencies of each allele, the darker the color of the tile, the higher the percentage of this particular kind of molecule sequence is present in the tissue. So this is sort of a liquid biopsy of the organ, not a tissue biopsy, but a liquid biopsy that harvests all the junk DNA, if you wish, that comes out of the organ to analyze what uh, obtain a reflection of what's going on in the tissue. And it turns out that it allows you to quantify in a way the risk for pancreatic cancer because all the normal people cluster here. Those are the pancreatitis. Those are the cancers. And this plots two metrics derived from, from those numbers. And you can see that an individual that has chronic pancreatitis, normal to chronic pancreatitis, will be traversing this slope with increasing numbers of in the metrics. And in fact, that's the case. And we are putting this to work in the real world. Uh, more recently with, with 454 Technologies of Roche and in collaboration with the Catalan Institute of Oncology. And uh, the, the latest results suggest that we can uh, very nicely separate levels of risk uh, for subjects that are on the way if at risk to develop pancreatic cancer and colorectal cancer. And of course, uh, like every time you want to translate uh, a more fundamental insight into the clinic, you need to design a diagnostic <laughs> technology that will be practical, uh, robust, and not very expensive or less expensive than the technologies. 454, uh, of course, is labor intensive in terms of analysis of data. Uh, to give you an example, uh, on 30 samples, we generated 18,000 variables that boil down to 33 clinically actionable variables, to variables uh, single nucleotide variants to uh, develop the MLDA spectrum. And using, for example, uh, fluiding technology, uh, you can always achieve the same sensitivity when you know what genes and what positions to target. So in all the uh, aspects that I'm bringing up today in terms of moving them to translational research, I think this is an important aspect that we must keep in mind is generating the conditions that enable uh, using in the clinical practice uh, those insights. Now when I uh, 
spoke about how tumor developments I, I develops. I told you it's a microevolutionary process, and it's described by metapopulation dynamics. In fact, tissues are composed of patches of cells that do not migrate in principle from patch to patch, and mutations introduce diversity in the different patches. And this is indeed the situation in tumors. We always thought about tumors uh, being monoclonal and homogeneous, and recently we have rediscovered the fact that they are extremely heterogeneous. Again, from the Clevers group, here you can see the composition of an adenoma, and it shows that there are different metapopulations inside of the adenoma that are derived from different stem cell lineages uh, that are present in the genesis of this tumor. So it is polyclonal or oligoclonal, and it is composed of islands of tumor cells. And developed tumors are the same. If you take little islands of a colonic carcinoma and you genotype them for, in this case, two different genes that are involved in the pathogenesis of colonic carcinomas, you find out a great variegated appearance of little islands of cells that are homozygous, heterozygous, or even wild type. And we know those are tumor cells because they look, they have the phenotype of tumor cells, and they have homozygous mutations of BAT26, a genomic marker of tumor in this case. So the question is, how do those populations coexist, and how do they change? And you can model that in silico, and uh, we did this with Ricard Soleil, and you can come with very similar uh, aspects to the clinical cases that we have studied, and then you can manipulate those models and ask questions about how are they generated and what rules do they follow to, to generate this particular appearance. Uh, and the importance of ecological uh, theory here is that it introduces a very powerful parameter introduced first by Tillman, which is disturbance. Disturbance is any nonspecific random cause of death, death in the population. And it turns out that disturbance is probably the single most powerful agent altering or changing the dynamics among the different cell populations that form the tumor. And to give you an example of that power of disturbance, uh, here is a simulation in which at certain mutational rate you start generating tumors. And here you can see the increasing mutational rate uh, and the different cell death replication ratios on that axis. And you can pick an area of this model that does not develop tumors in many, many hundreds of runs. And you can now set disturbance to occur in this particular territory. And what you see is that disturbance does not require an increased rate of mutation to generate tumors in the model. And it does so with a very <coughs> fairly steep gradient uh, so that it gives you the sense, indeed, of the power of mutation I I of disturbance, sorry, of the power of disturbance in generating the tumor progression uh, that has a full-blown tumor as an outcome. And this is another example in which you can set a, a subject with a life of 200 steps. You can set up mutations that are occurring and being cleansed. And you can introduce disturbance in this scenario. And as you dial up the degree of disturbance, you begin to generate these two types of subjects. One that has many more mutations in many more loci and at higher frequencies, but does not develop a tumor, and one that does indeed expand clones with limited gro limitless growth, which signs a tumor. And that is a random event. We, do, we cannot control it, but as you dial up recurrence, you begin to have more and more individuals shift onto the tumor side. So there's no question that disturbance is very powerful. And I bring it up because Therapy, obviously, is a great uh, disturbance in tumors. And as we push targeted therapies, we have to be able to model the effects of disturbance on those populations. So let me just go uh, rapidly to the last question, which is, uh, what is the evolutionary history of tumors? 
And this, of course, is a paradox because cancer doesn't make evolutionary any sense in the organism. It is a dead end. And so, except in two instances, uh, in Tasmanian dogs and in the genital tumors of dogs, it is not horizontally transmitted. So, uh, and yet, as you have seen, the fundamental property of the cancer cell is the capacity to evolve, and that's why we generate resistant clones. And it turns out that if you look at the appearance of cancer genes in terms of phylogenetic scale, you find that they appear in nature as one transitions from unicellular to multicellular animals. And that has been at least found by two groups so that one can be led to think that the development of cancer is sort of uh, an atavism that the somatic cell, which is not allowed to evolve in a multicellular organism, to the unicellular state where it, to face uh, stress, develops an evolutionary program that enables the cell to adapt and to handle the stress. And so there are two important uh, capacitors of evolution or mechanisms that enable that evolution. One is H HSP90, and Margaret Lindquist has done very beautiful work showing how HSP90 enables the appearance of resistance in yeast because it allows cryptic genetic variation to accumulate. It makes cells robust to genetic variation, it tolerate, they tolerate mutations that would otherwise kill the cell, and thus they provide the variation that if the proper selection comes along and the proper challenge comes along, it can be grasped and expanded into a tumor. The second capacitor are probably junk sequences, and there is a particular one that's interesting. It's a line one sequence, and those uh, retrotransposones are often activated in tumors, uh, and they are uh, shown here by the work of Sebastian Spasowski is uh, demethylated significantly in human tumors and curiously enough it's the youngest elements in evolution that we have acquired most recently in terms of retrotransposons that are inactivated or hypomethylated and presumably active in the tumors and those of course are powerful mutators of the genome and there is plenty of evidence that they are activated in human tumors. And to make things more attractive in terms of thinking about capacitors, there is now a lot of evidence that uh, HSP90 uh, and retrotransposons can cooperate in potentiating evolutionary capacity so that it would make sense if one wants to dampen the capacity to evolve of the cells to in fact inhibit those two agents that capacitate evolution. All right, so I'm out of time. Those are the people who uh, have contributed to the work at uh, different points in time uh, in the laboratory here at Yale and in uh, Barcelona in the Institute Catalan of Oncology. And it's been supported by NCI for a long time and then uh, Marsha Israel and the EDRN. Thanks very much.